Our next speaker, guest, uh, showman, is Satyender pa Palkale. Pakale, I said it earlier. That's correct. Pakale, Pakale. Huh. Yes. is an internationally acclaimed industrial designer. He was born in India and now lives and works in Amsterdam. He earned a bachelor's degree in engineering at VNIT in Nagpur and a master's in design at the Industrial Design Center IIT in Bombay. And after that, he went on to study advanced product design at the Art Center College of Design in Switzerland. Um, Pakale initially has worked with Philips Design in the new business creation department, focusing on innovative products in digital communication and transportation. In 1998, he set up his own design practice in Amsterdam. Renowned companies such as Capellini, Bosa, Colombo Design, Magis, Ofect, Alessi, and Tubes are, have, have been among his clients. He was head of the department in 2006-2010, head of the Department of Master of Design Program for Humanity and Sustainable Living Programs at the Design Academy in Eindhoven. Uh, Mr. Palkali works across a wide range of disciplines, synthesizing new applications of material and technologies with great ingenuity. An important aspect of his work, besides industrial design, are limited edition pieces represented by Gabriel Amann in Cologne, Germany. And he has, his work is in uh, a number of museum collections such as the Stedelijk in Amsterdam and Centre Pompidou in Paris and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Uh, Mr. Palkili is going to give us a short presentation on his work and um, we were talking over lunch and he's extremely articulate and has lots of ideas so he's going to make my job very easy. So, Jinder? I hope. All right. Thank you, Vijay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'll just quickly go through the presentation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rajeshri. Thank you, Rajeshri. Uh, well, I've been given this task to talk about excellence in design production, which is a tough one, but I will try, try, try and do my best. Uh, anything to talk about design, the first thought comes to my mind is consumption. And as we are proceeding towards it, uh, we as a nation are getting into it. I'm not going to talk about it, something very serious, we need to think about it, and I think design has a solution for it. Uh, consumption in my opinion, is a disease, and disease that can be treatable. And I think consumption is definitely a treatable disease, and we ought to look at that before we get that one. And if we get that one, it's going to be a disaster, because we are a big nation. Uh, often what happens is uh, there is a huge fascination, which I have, I'm a product of that, uh, technology. Uh, but often technology is talked in terms of almost like a technology for the sake of technology, and nobody talks about technology uh, which has to be coupled with humanity. That's what design is all about. And that can be only done with optimism. And every project, if you don't have optimism, nothing really happens. And I'll try and go through some projects to talk about it. Uh, as we leave, everything is really global. Talking about nation is kind of archaic, old, old-fashioned. Uh, everything what we do is very, very intrinsically linked with each other. I know when I'm talking about this, I know we, as we stand in this nation, there are a lot of people who, are, who don't have those possibilities. And I hope that will change soon. But everything is interconnected. And that, those kind of cultural connections are something which has a big impact on what we do, wherever we are. Uh, seen from that perspective, talking about production, and especially in our context, actually, of production, uh, having the facilities we have, uh, I, I brought in here some of the examples my, from my own experience uh, from different parts of the world. Uh, here I'm going to show you some really production of everyday objects. You see here, uh, there's not much to say. M many of you have seen uh, places like this. And by the way, this is not China. This is Japan, just a few months ago. And what I want to say is that these facilities we also have, but somehow we hardly managed to get that level of production. And that's the question always, always kind of came to my mind all these years. And I still don't have a perfect answer, but I, I hope I can resolve. Uh, this is another example. Uh, these, are the, these are the like generations of making samurai swords. You know what samurai swords are from Japan. Uh, and these swords, these, pe these crafts people, they updated their technology. Now they use these bench presses. And this is again Japan, not China. A lot to learn from that. All that 
sensitivity lead to this industrial design. To me, this is one of the beautiful in industrial design which has become universal. It's a soya sauce bottle, probably you've seen it. Amazing innovation, how you drop it, how you control it. It's, it's a beautiful innovation and it has become international and it is genuinely Japanese. You cannot, un unmistakably Japanese. And my always been curiosity, can we create object out of our nation which will have that unique identity and can go beyond the borders. This is another beautiful example from the same designer. It's a butterfly st stool, again very much industrial design made with just one bent ply and manufactured still in production since 50s and this is from this great man. Sadly he died few months ago, uh, Mr. Shori Yanagi. Uh, I want to bring in some other examples which we kind of glorify and through my talk I will try my best to demystify a lot of myths about design and this is one example can you guess where this could be from this is post World War Italy from the northeast part, part of Italy the, the Veneto region of Italy it was extremely impoverished region actually it's hardly we think about it when we think about Italy these were the realities then and they managed to transform themselves within no time after post World War into this reality which you all know this from Dolce Vita these kind of images now these are some Italian factories this is Alessi and a lot of these things when you look at these these are not mysteries actually these production facilities are could be anywhere else in the world talking from design production perspective what really makes that difference is the cultural uh, critical cultural contribution what that happens into that technological uh, production development and that is where we could do something unique actually. Uh, I'm going to go through, run through different kind of projects and here I will show you one early project. This was done in 1996 and I will run through project and try and illustrate all these last 20 years of journey, give you idea uh, what's happening now. Anyway, this was, this was a car, a concept car done together for Pangea together with Philips Design. This was a car for environmental research on Antarctica. This is in 1996 we were cooking this. So basically that time nobody was talking about environment. This is, the idea was that's uh, the first prototype built in Torino, the Italian best, built the best prototype in the world even today without any doubt. And uh, this is the, the working prototype and all the hope it works it has it's 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 a vehicle conceived well before the internet became reality there was no gps in 1996 you know and internet not was not on every desktop so you you have a you have a satellite uh, disk up there for navigation when you go in un unknown territory and you have a 360 degree camera on the top so the team of two scientists can go and do a research and all the electromechanical devices are on outside there's a hybrid engine it's a working prototype and to make a working prototype make it work within 10 months it's a huge task and that's the interior now again 1996 we did not have a flat panel display like all of our computers are these days they used to be CRT tubes this big and we we also made made it work actually there was a telemedia camera we never thought about telemedia camera. Now everybody has a small, tiny camera on their MacBook, and we also made, made that work. This is 1996. Anybody has a chance to go to Renault factory showroom, you can go and have a look at this prototype, which is still there. And this was shown at Geneva Motor Show in 97. At the Geneva Motor, uh, you look at the how the scientists can work in a remote con, uh, space and how they can be connected with the base station. That was the idea. So these were some of the fantastic possibilities to work on a cutting edge technology then. And this was another project which was done with fellow Indian who was supposed to be also in this conference, Mr. Sam Pedroda. Uh, he had a patent on one of the, one of the uh, telecommunication thing and he approached me and we created this oh, oh, a digital wallet for elderly people. This is done in 1997. You can see the size of it. You can see the feature on it. It has one docking station. This is the space, how it can be used for elderly people, especially for their uh, health related issues and other issues, which is a simple object. You see it here. And now this is well before 2001 when we got the beautiful iPod. But look at the proportions and you can understand yourself the size and the shape of it. Anyway, having done all these things, these are some other electronic stuff. I, what I was very curious about is to really try and understand the really cultural content in design, what I mean by the qualities we have here in our nation actually. 
So I was very curious about making things. Making things meaning really the culture of making things. And you see here in every culture around the world you have different ways of making. Making on all kind of ways. And one of the examples I pick up from India is this one. And nobody can tell me this is not design. This is inherently rooted in our mindset actually within India. You see all these solutions all over India in every corner of India. And uh, as I grew further, uh, these, the, the, the design uh, practice grew into industrial design and a studio project. Those were personal curiosities, exploring things into uh, kind of different processes, makings, materials, typologies. And they may, be, may or may not become edition pieces because that's how the work grows. And eventually work grew into very many different directions from object to technologies to cultural exhibitions to all the way to architecture. And every project has this basic, basic, let's say, uh, conception or desire in every project. Think with senses, feel with mind, try to create object which has genuinely that sensorial quality. And that's how I started. So I quit all this high tech work for a while and went back in a Bastar region in a, in a Madhya Pradesh in India. And you know this, this technique, the bell metal technique. Uh, that's how it works there. That, that's the open fire kiln actually. And I did series of objects. I'm not a craftsman. I'm not, neither one to be one actually. And I have a great respect for artisan culture. And we have a great artisan culture in this co country. And and leading from those projects, this is what it happened. This process, most of you probably know, is a simple clay model. You make a, make a um, kind of a mold. You collect a wax from a forest. You make a spaghetti of the wax. And you apply the wax. And finally, you melt the wax and you get the casted object. Uh, now, it's apparently a very archaic process. This process has been in every part of the world. In ancient Africa, they had one. They, in ancient Japan, they had one. And I try to create this object which has some kind of a sensorial quality. And as I'm doing these exercises, I was always concerned about some other kind of craft, craft te techniques we have. And one of the craft techniques is the uh, rapid prototype. In 2000, this was quite early on actually, the rapid prototype was getting, 3D printing was getting very accessible. And I was experimenting with this because as you make a bell metal object, it doesn't have a seam in the same manner the steel lithography object also doesn't have a seam. All these objects led to project for LAC. And you see here different projects, stainless steel, very industrial, mass manufacturing, and so forth. This is a hanger that got transformed into gas injection molded plastic. And then something led to further. This is bent glass. Now, glass, as you know, is used in architecture for many, many years now, and especially now because there's a lots of lots of use of glass because of the strength of a glass get better. And they wanted to uh, use the glass in a such a way that you don't kind of waste the glass in any, any, any kind of way. And this is how it led to a sister company from this main company called Kurwet. And they invited different people. I was one of them. And that's le this led to a project which is a completely different way of bending a glass, which is quite technological actually and is highly precise work. And that led to this glass collection. Uh, you see there. And from there, this is exactly uh, where this long journey started of bell metal object. And I wanted to really create identity. There's an issue of identity which has been going on, and we debated it some or the other way. And here, I was curious about creating, creating a chair which has some kind of a resonance with, 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 the, with the kind of thing we're talking about. But yet, it looks in the future. It has those aspirations to go beyond. And, and it was all these exercises were being done here in India, all these things. It didn't succeed. I wanted to have a seamless object without any joint. And for that, we have to, again, design an object, design the material. That's what you see here. Move the, the exercise to Italy. And finally, we managed to get it made like this. And that's the finished product, which finally became a very super um, limited edition. Uh, having done that, I have always had this curiosity to create kind of a language which has some kind of a resonance with the way we live things and the kind of iconography we have. And that led to this chair. This is another new kind of craftsmanship, new kind of technology we use in terms of using 3D softwares. Uh, 
and Capolini always wanted to do it upholstery and I'm always curious about the question of industrial design and if you make it in upholstery it becomes extremely expensive and un unaffordable. Then this prototype, this was again made in India by the way, just so you see here and from there that's in Milan, that's Paola sitting there and finally again to make this thing I'm just showing we use lots of technology this is again a reverse engineering 3D scanning checking the final prototype and often manufacturers don't want to go for it because there's a huge investment and that is here in mold because that's the risk finally they did it and this is the final result. This is another very exciting project which was done for Moroso. This was again exploration of that iconography, trying to think about something different. This is a multi-chair scanning again making you know who's there uh, and this is you can sit like this. You show this chair to the kids they have no trouble everybody asks how you're going to sit on this and there's the legendary design, uh, uh, founder of cartel the industrialist the first generation industrialist from Italy uh, sitting on there. All right we go further. I have always been curious about materials. Materials are very critical and I always wanted to use materials in a different way. So I had a chance to work with ceramic. I am not a traditionally ceramist. So I wanted to use ceramics in all kind of way, handmade, you have an industrial ceramic using a terracotta as well as with aerospace bonding and different kind of materials you use in high tech ceramics as well. One of the early project was this object which refers to the Kerala object. There might be some people here from Kerala here. Are there some people here from Kerala? Yes, you have this puttu, you know, how do you say it, puttu, yeah, puttu, puttu, yeah, and I tried to take that as an object and, and try to create something contemporary. So this is what came up, it's being manufactured by, by Bosa, which could be used for different kind of use and it does work and to show this object you really have to use it because it really feels right in hand. From there I did this ceramic different prototypes, the idea of a chair was to just to create a provocation object. Now when you talk about ceramic everybody thinks it's, it's everybody has a coffee cup or a tea cup, ceramic seems to be simple, it's a very complex material and when, and but when you talk about carbon fiber everybody thinks about just high tech and this notion of sometimes high tech and low tech is kind of meaningless and just as a provocation I did this prototype where there is a carbon fiber on the top of ceramic, now look at this closely. This is a very articulate work, it's a carbon fiber on the top of ceramic. That's a totally irrational thought actually, it's not necessary to make put a carbon fiber on a ceramic, that ceramic chair is strong enough and carbon fiber is even stronger. This was a provocation to call it is it a high tech or low tech, that was mere exercise in terms of making this kind of a statement. Going from there, every culture we give flowers so why not flower offering chairs. So this was the exercises I've been doing and thanks to the gallery Gabriel Aman, she always created a space for me that I could do at least once once a year one prototype and if it is it, it's any good it's made into a small series. And the idea of making these exercises is always to understand these qualities and try and bring it to the mass manufacturing. So here you see the flower offering chair in different glazes. Uh, in all these years I jumped to now very quickly to wood, wood, wood as a material I never use it all these years actually, I never use traditional, I never did any traditional uh, furniture or those things but I wanted to use in a very very basic way. This is object made in India a couple of thousands of years back, this I found in one Japanese publication and when I went to a uh, place in Ahmedabad they also have it in their collection and this very archaic basic way of carving I wanted to use it in a completely new way and this is object we design which is a kind of a chest launch, a monolithic object, I'm checking a prototype there before it goes for scanning, this is being scanned, this is being now remodeled in a computer, we, we plan how we're going to use the wood there, this is being CNC machine on the on a lathe, to, uh, on a CNC machine to, to, uh, to carve it, to machine it and after that machining I found a sixth generation artisan in Bolzano in Italy up in the mountain, they make these kind of sculptures in the back and I explain him everything and finally from that we got this final object and that is a kind of excellence we are talking about if you call excellence and are trying to use some kind of artisanal quality in a completely refreshing way. The objective of this is it's possible because one could do this prototype and I hopefully I could bring this quality to home appliance one day. And having done those things, I have done a lot of other things is that the, a lot of big brands actually, they resonated with some of these things we've been talking about and they came and we did some projects together with them and this is for Frankfurt Fair 
and I created a provocation that we can't afford to buy cheap things in a way that cheaply made things create a lot of trash and that's what led to this exhibition that led to this diagram which, which explains like how we could choose objects if we have a choice uh, to, to select and not to deny the objects which help us dream as well as the objects of utility and from there this was the exhibition in 2007 at Frankfurt Fair giving a critical comment on our, our society which is a very consumer oriented society and how design can play a role in it. Looking from there, I'm going to Tots. Tots invited me, you know, everybody knows Tots, there's a big showroom here, and they, they wanted me to think what could be a new way of talking about this craftsmanship. They have a very articulate craftsmanship, and for me, if the leather shoe is made that, that precisely using their craftsmanship, it's like a mother of pearl, and there's a pearl is the shoe. That was the idea. They liked that idea so much that they adopted the, the, the whole idea for all the flagship stores, and this was from all over the world actually they shown this thing. This was more like a cultural communication you can say that. From there recently just a few months ago actually Alcantara the company from Italy who makes lots of textile they use in Ferrari and all these high end cars as well as in aviation. They invited me to do something with the Maxi, the Maxi Museum from Zahadid in, in Rome. And the idea was to, to explain this very uh, process of making this microfiber which is the Alcantara material in a very very completely different way but the ordinary person can go and walk in there and understand how the, how the material could be made or at least get some, some kind of idea about it. And from that all those experimentation and visits to factory and talking to the technicians led to this idea and you see that I did some experimentation here understanding how, how I wanted to use the, the reflective surface and that led to this piece which is quite big, three and a half meters and it's been installed in Maxi. You can go and have a look at it if you have a chance to go to Rome. And the idea was to show this endless process of making a microfiber but in a very refreshing and iconic way almost like an installation. So that's a part of the practice in a different way and that's the reflective surface which, which is a polished mirror, mirror aluminum. Having talked about all this project, the, the basic curiosity has always been and still is, is industrial design. And industrial design I mean is industrial design can, can really create a huge impact in a society and especially society like ours in India. Uh, I'm going to go through very selected few projects about industrial design and I'm going to talk about some of those issues here as well. First thing I'm going to talk about is the company called Hastings which is established in 1852 if I'm not wrong and it's in north of Sweden. They once asked me to create the installation for them which was like a dream bedroom with tons of flowers and then they, they asked me to visit the factory that led to idea of making as they make these high end beds why not to bring that technology into a sofa and create a sofa that will hopefully will be as lasting as their beds. And they have these Vikings working in the factory, you see those big tattoos and you see the, the work, they use all natural material, there's a horse here that's a natural wool. This is in north of Sweden, completely ecological, completely sustainable, they give lifelong guarantee on this thing. And this is an example of how they push the limit of making something to the extreme actually, to get that subtle quality. Uh, they never made so far in their entire history so far, so for them this was super exciting. The elderly person sitting on my, on the right side was super enthusiastic, they worked through, the, through all their holidays to make the prototype to be shown at the, at the Stockholm Furniture Fair last year. So, and that's the final finish. Going from there, there has been a lot of projects which cross over with architecture, going, going towards the direction of making objects which become systems and here is one system project, a shelving system. Uh, which is done for Italian company in the region of Bologna. There is a huge tradition of making objects in uh, machined object actually. There could be all kind of processes, extrusion to manufacturing to all kind of thing. And here is an example of all these parts are manufactured in ex extruded aluminium. Those who are designers they might get a bit surprised, a bit puzzled how come this yellow part is made in extrusion. But believe me it is extrusion and there is a patent on it. And so all these three components are made on ex with the extrusion. It's a, amazing automated factory and that led to this result. As it, the idea was to create a shelving system which can be shipped across in a very, very small container and that's what it finally brings down to. So it's, it's a very flexible system but it's very sturdy when you assemble it. You see there, thanks to the food detail you can create. Last but not the least, I'll jump to the last one. Uh, 
well in every industry there is a huge amount of budget spent on a promotion and there is a very little budget spent on a actual product creation and I am not the management guru neither I want to be one but I never understand if there is no product there is no company. Here is an example where I was given a chance by a company called Tubas they call it. Uh, they make ma they manufacture radiators now radiators you know in all the colder countries you have radiators and radiators are generally stuck in a corner they are they are ugly they are hidden in the, uh, behind the curtain or something like that and here is a company they really were very curious they say we like your work and we want to rethink radiator and well I'm not I'm not grown up in a, in a place of radiator so I had a completely new fresh thought on a radiator and I say why the radiators are stuck in a corner why not they should be bang in the middle of the room where you really need to heat up and that was the idea to create a model where the air passes through seems like a simple idea but that was a huge task to make it work but thanks to the company who, who had really really a vision and a belief in a design that they put in so much effort in prototyping all these prototyping different manufacturing processes and finally tons of meetings that's the CEO and the head of R&D there's discussing and finally we ma managed to solve all the issues and they invested heavily into mass manufacturing into new technology that's the product testing here you see here and that's the production so that's the radiator which can be integrated in a in a in architecture as seamlessly it's arguably the only radiator which can be built in a wall like you see further here from the ceiling can have a water that's the electric version you can create the space with it they were so excited they wanted me to take a photo with it and that's basically what it is finally and if you give me one more chance I can show you one small project if you're still in interested yes. <laughs> so I can take you to the moon right now would you like yes. all right uh, talking about the outer space has been a big fascination for all of us on the planet and now thanks to few people it might become reality almost can become in all of our lifetime uh, and keeping that in view recently there was a beautiful project initiated by one artist uh, she lives in Amsterdam she is from Spain uh, Alicia Framis and she created a project where she invited designers and architects to think about what would be the life on the moon my take on this is if when you talk about the astronauts uh, they get extremely emotional about talking about earth when you see the planet earth from outer space they get incredibly emotional because it's a very fragile thing and the and you forget about all the borders because you don't see any borders that's a fiction we have in our mind so talking about the moon the idea was can we think about what would be the life on the moon now this project is as, as much as visionary is also is a pro, it's some kind of a provocation to make us think about some of our issues actually and the, the idea and approach was can moon be a resource and as we know from the ISRO Indian Space Research Organization the Chandrayana discovered the water particles on the moon so maybe it could be a resource can it be a kind of resource which we can see it in a different way not in a military way not in a political way but in a completely another perspective and what would be that life in a microgravity that was a question I was fascinated by this is a very recent work just before flying I, I, I opened this exhibition in Utrecht in which is a city next to Amsterdam so my understanding is I, I my, my, my wish is my desire is that everybody on the planet if you get a chance to see the earth from the outer space what a beautiful thing it would be probably will get rid of all the troubles we have well that's a wishful thinking but this is a reality you know all, the, all of you know this man and he was taken to prove this thing thanks to this man on the right Peter Diamandis to prove that this is possible and this is his experience the zero gravity you see that a lot of experiments done in a zero gravity and one of the thing is that when I met Peter he visited me in Amsterdam that's my studio in Amsterdam it was very fascinating to talk about these issues and engage with some of the, the uh, scientists who are working on this in a European Space Agency and one of the things we found out and what we know that now from the ex experiments that when you go in a microgravity your angle of vision in a horizontal direction get reduced and in a vertical when direction gets bigger so presuming that every grandmother gets to go to moon for a weekend 
then I was thinking what would be that object I will design which is simple, which is human, which is not scary, technical, uh, which will help normal people to assist to, cha to experience their change of perception on, on the moon and this is the moonwalker object you see here where it, it has a, it has a, what, it has a small viewfinder which shows you the degree of angle how you, it changes and it will assist you to help presuming that like today we don't need to take a, any kind of training to fly we can take a take a take a flight without any training in the same manner hopefully we'll be able to take a flight to the moon without any training so this is object now i'm showing this object because of its making quality if you look at the way it is made it is very articulate and this is made in holland this is made in the south of holland there are some amazing qualities in making and manufacturing putting this together it balances like that it's transparent you see there the volume that's the viewfinder there's a there's the same some kind of a texture inside which ho helps you hold that's called grip force control and there's the indication of the of the angle of vision changing and this design that's the coordinates of the studio and I, I propose that this should be manufactured on the moon made on the moon not to be made here and shipped there <laughs> and when you talk about the moon the place is different so we have to design a new scale for the moon our normal uh, metric system will not work there that's the object and that's it thank you very much Um, I realize I, I, I only knew really your chairs and a, and a couple other things and it's amazing actually to see the, the sense of consistency throughout everything. Um, you were talking about your love of materials and working with that and that comes through very strongly but I think also what comes through very strongly is a natural, pr uh, I mean there's a very sculptural quality to everything and, what's, and I think what people when they get excited about design is to see the, this process that you go through that is about solving a problem and working with a client and being very, very practical, but in the end, coming up with something that really looks like your aesthetic and, and something that's, that's very, very sculptural. And I, I'm thinking specifically of that radiator that uh, sort of ends up like uh, multi-forms uh, and almost like a jolly screen that can stand in, in the middle of the room, which seems not only like a fantastic sculptural um, resolution, but also even more practical for a radiator, right? To have it could be completely surrounded by it there. Um, do we have any questions? Do we? I'm, I, I'm a little, a little dis distressed just to see um, so many interesting products being commissioned by so many good companies, but nothing seemingly happening for you in India. And um, we hope maybe through conferences, forums such as this, there could be business people here um, that will see the potential of um, commissioning you to, to do things for the for the other. Ms. Party. Sure. My question is really, what do you see from your context as? Um, the impediments to really have uh, this kind of uh, a facility infrastructure in India. What can we as business people, people who are interested in uh, promoting um, young designers and investing in design itself, what would you like um, us to do for people like you? Uh, I, I think uh, that's, a, that's a wonderful question. Thank you. Uh, what I would like, uh, well, everything and nothing. What, what can I say? Uh, I think the most important thing is, uh, I was talking with Peter at lunch actually, I would say the kind of difference, I mean we have a very unique condition in India, you know we often underestimate that actually. What, what I mean by unique condition that there are some, some scenario we have here, I, I, I bought some examples from, from uh, uh, Japan, there were some examples from uh, Sweden and Italy. And all these countries, I mean, they have a lot, lot to offer and understand. They had a long time to develop those things. And our conditions are quite different. I mean, at the same time, uh, we have certain kind of scenario which is very unique to our condition, 
situation here because the demographics, the, the geography is huge, the population is amazing. And finally, we see that as a resource. And I think we need to have a self-belief, I would say, a cultural confidence to kind of take that step and, and invest into it. And I, I do see there's a possibility to do that, actually, you know. And it could happen in a different kind of areas, not just in one area, actually. Often design, as we all said, and there has been a talk about it, is, is always get marginalized and get supplied to home household objects, and that's where it stops somehow. And it can go to all kind of direction, transportation, public systems, and so forth. And my curiosity is how one could play that role in an effective manner and contribute in that sense, you know. So, what could be done? I mean, a lot could be done, you know, a lot of things are there. I think what we have to just get started, actually, in the right way. What is, what is, what is, what is it that you miss most? I think miss most is actually the, is the, the awareness, and the awareness lead to confidence as well, that one could take and do that thing. So I think the, the facilities and uh, things are shown here, they are not particularly very special. I must say that. And those things also exist here for a long time. What is not happening, and when I talk to colleagues here, is what is not happening is that, that refinement, the quality, the cultural consistency that we could bring in, what we have in other fields of work, you know? And can we bring that and deliver those results, actually? And that, that is basically has to come from within. But of course, a lot of it is market dependent. Uh, yes and no, I don't completely agree with that. I don't ag completely agree with that because we are actually quite open canvas. We're such an open canvas that any can, can be built and made on that. And, and there is a huge aspiring kind of uh, mindset here, which is, which is very, very fascinating. And I, I think it's our responsibility to take them in the right, right direction. Yeah? I do think what, one of the things that's most exciting about your practice also is that you're almost naturally not, but creating a bridge between the future and the very, very distant past and seeing um, materials and processes from the very, very distant past as being relevant and high-tech at the same time. One thing I had a problem um, with Kareem Rashid's presentation was that he was almost too much emphasis on the, the high-tech futuristic and many times I th felt with his design vocabulary sort of falling into cliches of futurisms that have been with us for a hundred years now already, this streamlined, you know, lime green and orange thing, you know, it's not, that's not a particularly new vocabulary. So I think what's your, your aesthetic of looking in both directions is actually a much more healthy uh, way to go about it. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you.